Now, while aging and obesity are the big two, um, there is a third contributor that I'm just going to mention now before we get into the big ones, and that is inactivity or just sedentary lifestyle, not moving. Studies on bed rest, like those from NASA, uh, designed to simulate uh, space travel, show that even short periods of immobility, just like a week, can cause rapid muscle loss up to 1% to 2% of muscle mass per week. And it does so actually by amplifying anabolic resistance. So these human studies have shown that when you then go in to the sedentary person and attempt to stimulate muscle protein synthesis, it doesn't work as well. So this means with in everyday terms that just sitting at a desk job or um, prolonged inactivity can mimic aspects of aging or obesity, making it a crucial um, component to helping with muscle mass. The reason this is so important is think about the way the average young individual lives nowadays compared to, say, my generation, where you know me getting close to 50 or so. And this is a a very, very different lifestyle where kids just sit around more, it, it, which is pretty sobering because you think that they may start at even childhood beginning to trigger some of these signals that mimic the process that's happening in their 70-year-old grandparents. Okay, now that we've discussed the origin and me touching on another one, the, the sedentary living, let's zoom into the big ones. Uh, aging and obesity. And let's start with aging because that is the main one. That is, in fact, the aspect that gave birth to the whole idea of anabolic resistance. Uh, with aging, there are several physiological changes that converge to impair muscles' anabolic response. One of the most significant is the decline in anabolic hormones. Now, I mentioned testosterone a moment ago, and that's a very relevant one. But it's more than that. Also, growth hormone and one of growth hormones products, IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor. Just to make that last comment I made clear, where I said that IGF-1 is a product of growth hormone, it is. So growth hormone comes from the anterior pituitary, and it acts throughout the body. Uh, so it is itself a signal, just like testosterone is. Um, but growth hormone is unique because it's its own signal, but it's coming from the brain. Most of the brain signals go to somewhere else. Like testosterone doesn't come from the brain. That comes from the gonads, testes and ovaries. And even then it is coming because there's a signal from the brain telling it to be released. So growth hormone is its own signal and it's unique because it's direct from the brain. But also growth hormone will come down to the liver and stimulate the liver to create IGF-1. And IGF-1 is a very powerful anabolic or building up hormone. Well, all of these hormones are down with age. IGF-1 in particular is a very key activator of the mTOR pathway. In fact, far more than growth hormone. So anyone who is using growth hormone to get big muscles, it's not actually the growth hormone that's promoting the muscle growth. It would be the downstream activation of IGF-1. And when IGF-1 signaling is reduced, however, like it is with age, the muscle's ability to build and maintain protein is compromised. Another issue is just the reduced delivery of amino acids to muscle tissue. Aging impairs insulin signaling, as we've discussed previously. The age is aging is very much a cause of insulin resistance. Now it's not a direct cause. There are other factors here. But suffice it to say, if insulin signaling is down, which it is with aging on average, that actually impairs insulin mediated capillary recruitment or, or vasodilation. Uh, and that means you're delivering less amino acid load to the muscle. And so it doesn't reach the muscle, muscle, muscle as well. Now, this is important as just a very brief tangent. Few people appreciate insulin's effects on vasodilation, promoting blood flow to the muscles and other tissues. When we think about insulin, we often only think about its ability to induce glucose uptake or its ability to direct the use of various nutrients in cells. But even before insulin gets to the cells of the tissue of interest, say muscle or liver or fat tissue, it's having an effect on the cells of the blood vessel. And again, a primary effect is to induce vasodilation. In fact, there's an entire, pardon another tangent within a tangent, line of thinking that much of how insulin promotes 
muscle glucose uptake is less so through the direct signaling on the muscle to open up these glucose transporters and more so a, a purely function of stimulating a dramatically increased amount of blood flowing to the muscle itself. Now, that might have been an unnecessarily complicated tangent. Just suffice it to say, insulin promotes substantial changes in blood flow to muscle. Uh, and when insulin's working well, it expands the blood vessels, promoting greater blood flow. When insulin is not working well, then the endothelium of the blood vessel is not responding very well. The blood vessels stay constricted, and that reduces blood flow. If blood flow is reduced, you're going to, as I stated and at the beginning of this entire tangent squared, then you are delivering fewer amino acids. The amino acid load is reduced to the muscle. Now, beyond that, with aging still, there's also a shift in signaling within the muscle. Some proteins like myostatin and TGF-beta are signals which inhibit muscle growth, and these tend to go up with age. So you take a muscle biopsy of a younger person, take a muscle biopsy of an older person, you're going to see myostatin levels and TGF-beta much higher in the older muscle. That's a problem, again, because those block muscle protein synthesis and retention. So they also suppress satellite cell activation, which are these little cells that are future muscle cells just sort of waiting on the sides for their opportunity to come into the game and become muscle cells. Well, they stay there. We aren't activating those satellite cells as well. So muscle regeneration gets compromised. Ultimately, all of these signals come together to tip the balance towards more atrophy or muscle wasting. Now, one of the more compelling pieces of evidence for anabolic resistance and aging comes from a recent study just published in 2024 by, the, by Luke Van Loon in his lab at Maastricht University. They compared muscle protein synthesis rates in older adults after consuming either an omnivorous meal, in other words, animal protein, or a vegan meal. And both meals were matched for calories and protein content. That is very, very important. So there was the same amount of protein content in both meals and calories because calories also matter. Fat also matters in this. But the animal-based protein source stimulated significantly higher muscle protein synthesis than the vegan meal or protein source. This finding underscores a very, very important point. Older adults with anabolic resistance cannot afford to rely on inferior proteins. While younger individuals may get away with lower quality proteins, which is to say plant-based proteins, older adults require a higher quality. And a lot of this is they need more leucine. That is that main amino acid I mentioned a moment ago, like whey or beef. You know, All these animal proteins will have much higher levels, but they need more of a push to get over that anabolic threshold. So this is a clear example of how aging muscle becomes more demanding and a little less forgiving. It needs more. Uh, building on that idea, other studies like those examining leucine thresholds show that older adults need a, about three to four grams of leucine per meal to hit peak synthesis. And that's almost double what you need in, in a younger person. But we also need to be mindful of sex differences. As much as I mentioned testosterone a moment, a moment ago, estradiol, the main estrogen, is also very relevant in this. And so women will often experience accelerated anabolic resistance post-menopause due to the estrogen drop, which further dampens IGF-1. It increases myostatin, making the uh, it, just making the individual, the, the gal, more mindful of some hormone strategies. But it's another reason to look a little more favorably at HRT. People may look at HRT just as with hormone replacement therapy as being relevant to, say, helping with Alzheimer's risk or heart disease. Well, also muscle because estradiol is, in fact, somewhat, albeit less potently similar to testosterone, a muscle protective hormone.